the Western Painted Turtle. Again, trying to pick some Oregon species. I thought it was just kind of colorful and nice. I didn't think about, you know, that they deal with them in the wild, in the rehab center, so sorry about that, to Bob. <laughs> um, and then otherwise I pick things like wood ducks. That is supposed to be the Oregon State insect. It's awfully small, but that's a, a yellow swallowtail. Um, I'm eating a pear. I've already taken lots of heat that that is a Dungeness crab and not a blue crab, because I'm originally from the Chesapeake Bay, the land of the blue crabs. So, um, and then uh, with the rest, like I just, you know, some wildflowers um, swinging from the tree, and then again, our forester leaning against the tree. So that, I think, is that. Um, I, oh, I should say, sorry, I have to, um, we are working on currently, lovely, um, ew, Bob, or YouTube man is what I call him, that's not his name, but um, he gave us a vector image. So, because once you blow these up, they get blurry. So we're still working on the vector image for um, the organ is alive. And this was a grant paid for. I got a small grant to do this, paid for by the Forest Park Conservancy. So they will eventually give us their vector image. And so when it blows up, it doesn't go blurry. Um, here at the department, lovely Ken Lofflink made an, uh, a, QR, a QR, yes, QR code for me. And it's because we've been talking a lot about through our licensing system, um, how to get folks that don't have a hunter and angler license, how do we interact with them? How do we get them to pay fees? How do we get them to donate and once they learn about o OCRF? And so that actually works. It's actually live. Um, when you scan it, you go straight to the OCRF Donate Here page. And as that improves, ah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, we have this our first demo. This is someone from the desert. I figured, <laughs> I just noticed that. I just donated. I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> donated a hundred So the hope is somebody with just their cell phone in their pocket can just go by and ping it. Instead of having a log on, instead of having a hunter and angling ID license, uh, ID and all of that, all of the lava, it avoids all of that, hopefully. As that grows, like for example, you know, when you go to Fred Meyer's or you try and pay your gas at Shell, you don't even need your credit card because you've entered all the, your data into the phone and you just go there and you know, with your face ID or your finger ID or whatever, it just links to your bank account and you just pay with your phone. So that, the hope is that that captures the dog walkers and the wildlife viewers and you know, all the people that we're not capturing right now. And, and it, it comes back home again to the city of Portland you know, that big population base that right now we're not reaching because they don't know our initials. So I was watching a medical show or some kind of show. I noticed that the x-ray was in the background. I did not do that on purpose. But what I noticed is the ad companies have definitely gotten over their existential crisis about streaming because their big whole big thing is there's no commercials. How do we air? How do we pay for this? Well, they figured it out. When you hit the pause button, an ad pops up and it won't go away until you make it go again. <laughs> and so, and it was actually really hard to take this picture because it kept queuing in on the QR code and taking me to the ad. So just so that you know, like this is something I think that is burgeoning and that we can hopefully take advantage of because when you travel, your boarding pass is a QR code, your bag tag is, your COVID screening, your prescriptions, eventually our licenses are gonna look like that. So. And the other thing is just the, the rest of the project that we're doing is focusing on urban ecology. And the linkage with Forest Park, which is the largest urban park, which is how this all started. They are a big beneficiary uh, from OCRF. Being the largest urban park, they wanted to talk about urban ecology. And so what we agreed to do for them is create what's called a webcomic, which is, that's what this is about. The web comic. This is a, a screenshot of the New York Times page about a month ago. And what a web comic is, all it means is that it vertical scrolls. And so it's just like any other comic, it's just how it's formatted. And so it's, it's meant to be read on a screen, meaning a laptop, a phone, and it scrolls instead of turning a page. And normal comics, just the comics you go down to a comic book store, that's a billion dollar industry, everybody gets that. What I didn't realize is so is this. 
it is huge. It, it burgeoned and it exploded during COVID because people couldn't go to stores. So now there's this whole genre of web comics. And this one was featured. And it's because it was so popular, it went into print and it's a New York Times bestseller. So that's kind of where all of this is going. And that's where maybe communication is going. And then hopefully, as we um, get a improved, new and improved website that could handle vertical scroll, um, that's where maybe some of our communication could go in terms of reaching newer, younger, different audiences, people who can pay fees, et cetera. So that's, I think, it. Yep. Hope you like the poster. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> Happy to take any questions. It's kind of good to be sitting down here. It's <laughs> <laughs> you don't have questions, but somebody already donated. Yeah, can we get a QR code when they click on it, they get an automatic hunting and fishing license paid for? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that's, I think, all of that's coming. All of that's coming. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I, do, I do just want to say thank you for the innovation yeah. and, you know, bringing us a uh, new ideas and new ways of thinking, new ways of connecting with um, with our urban community, because we have to. So thank you, it's fun, it's kind of fun, huh? Yeah, and all the work, yeah. And well, all the work. And thank you, and I got a grant for it, so that's good. And um, hopefully, when we have the Portland meeting, because the Forest Park Conservancy, like it, they paid for this, so it is theirs. They're gonna pay for the place and do their thing, but they're also gonna be posting a lot of this on their, on their website. And they hopefully will have some metrics to show, is it successful, is it not? Um, what audience is, is it resonating with, et cetera. And so maybe they can give us a little port, a report come the Portland meeting in December. That's the goal, is to have everything kind of done by fall so that they can tell us something by winter. So we'll see. So we'll learn more about this. Hopefully, hopefully. Thank well, you. thank you. Thank you. We will go then. Now that my microphone's on, Mike Gobbin, come on up. We will go to Exhibit D and talk about sport fishing regulations. It, it just wouldn't be right if we were at a meeting and we weren't telling people to turn their mics on. <laughs> your mic's off. Your, oh, your mic's not on. You're muted. <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And while Should Mike's getting queued. things queued up here, um, I think this uh, this will be our last item of the day, um, and then but before you all race out of here, I do have one thing I want to. It won't take long, but one thing I want to okay. uh, uh, hand out. So. Oh well, let us check on that. Um, maybe Michelle is already checking on that. But yeah. Okay. With Good that, yeah. Oh, yeah. go ahead, Mike. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Wall, uh, Vice Chairs Arnowitz, Commissioners, and Director Melcher. For the record, my name is Mike Gobbin. I'm the Recreational Fisheries Program Manager for Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I'm here today to present the 2023 Oregon Sport Fishing Regulations that you'll find in Exhibit D. Um, the first part of this presentation will briefly describe the opportunity for public input during this process. And then we'll step through some of the uh, highlights of the administrative rules and then the proposed changes uh, for 2023. Uh, so throughout the last year, um, the proposed changes uh, were solicited through email, phone calls, uh, and local meetings with the public. Um, we also, as we developed our proposals with our district staff, um, we this year for the first time actually uh, posted all of our proposed changes on our ODFNW recreation report um, so that folks that visit there can see uh, what the changes were coming, just trying to get a broader audience of seeing what we are proposing for the next year. Of course, uh, the materials were posted to the commission uh, website prior to the meeting. And today, um, I think we have a couple of folks signed up, I think, online in the room uh, to provide some additional testimony. So the first part of, the, of this is uh, looking at uh, readopting uh, Oregon administrative rules. Um, the way this works is that the current OARs um, are listed as 2022, what we need to do is update that to refer to 2023. And what that does in practice is readopts all the regulations from the previous year that we're not proposing to change. Um, additionally, we also will see some information in there in the OARs about the Rogue South Coast Plan, which you, as you recall, adopted back 
in, at the end of the year, in December of 21. So we wanted to make sure that we're incorporating all of that um, so that goes into effect um, as soon as possible. When it comes to the development of our regulations, we work really closely with our district staff who reaches out to the public and, and gets information and proposals from the public throughout the year. And they also look at the biology of their district, the conservation needs, and they, then they use these, these tenants up here, the guidelines, as they create and develop proposals throughout the year. Uh, so you can read it there just to speed things up, but today you'll see most of our regulations are kind of around the housekeeping and simplification for this year. And, and actually for, for 2023, we, we actually only have 17 proposed changes, um, which I've said the last couple of years as I've been up here, um, it's a market improvement uh, in our regulatory process. If you look back four or five years, we'd come before you with 60 plus. As we've gone through angling regulation simplification over the past few years, we've really seen uh, a large drop in the number of regulation changes that we have uh, that we're making, which is really at the end of the day, you know, good for the public because there's consistency um, from year to year. Uh, you'll see an attachment four. I'm sure you've looked at it already. Uh, all the proposed rule la uh, rule language um, that would look to modify regulations um, in the regulatory book. Now I'm going to uh, kind of click through this quickly, but I'll, I'll take any questions, of course. But first, I'm going to talk about some statewide proposal um, that that is being proposed to you today. And this one, um, there's a change being proposed to the zone regulations uh, for bass in rivers and streams. And most streams in Oregon, and the map up here kind of shows the distribution of bass uh, across the landscape. Most rivers in Oregon and the major bass fisheries are already fall underneath. Um, the no size limit, no bag limit regulation. In fact, we have about 24 regulations that show up as exceptions in our book that are just very redundant. Um, so over the past couple of years, we've actually had a fair amount of our district biologists come to us, come to me and propose that we look at the zone regulations as a conduit to, um, to create um, a, a just a more consistent uh, regulation um, across, across all the flowing water bodies. So we're proposing here that we'll look at each of the zone regs and we will uh, split that out so that we'll be managing bass and streams for no limit, uh, no bag limit and no size limit. And what that does also is we've been seeing through the years as bass continue to spread, the coquille is one example of that as we talked a lot about today. Um, we've been you know, almost every year coming in and adding another flowing water body um, to a place where bass have, have showed up. So we're trying to kind of get ahead of that a little bit. We are starting if, you know, as bass now, there's not a whole bunch that are spread throughout coastal streams, for example, but as soon as one shows up, we're going to want to take limits off. So this kind of gets ahead of that by allowing us to do it sort of preemptively um, before it happens. Um, so that's, that's one change. I'll be happy to go into that more detail if, if you all need to. Mike, one quick question, if yeah. I could, before you leave that one. One of the commenters said that striped bass are not included. Is that right? Is that because they're... <clears throat> Yeah, Salt water. This, yeah, so we have our bass species broken into different groups. A okay. few years ago, through simplification, we already removed all the bags and size limits on striped bass in all the waters of Oregon. So okay. we manage them so separately. They're already. So they're defined as they're, they're different species of fish, so we, we manage them differently. But all the regulations themselves are already no bag or size limit in all waters. Got it. Uh, the bass, in this case, we refer to the bass sort of as the group. Uh, they're the black bass species as, as a group, but it's smallmouth largemouth, and we have spotted bass as well in the state. And last year we changed the definition of bass to include spotted bass. So this kind of generally covers uh, the bass species. What we're really concerned about here is the bass in rivers and streams, because those tend to be the smallmouth. Those are riverine species. So th that's why we're proposing that change for smallmouth and flowing waters. One other question, Commissioner on, Yeah, on the same topic. So one of the commenters also mentioned about the species itself being move from the game fish to something else. We can't do that, can we? Because that's a statutory requirement. That's correct. Okay, and then the other, the other comment was, well, we should just get rid of the fishing licenses for bass. For, that'd be, I talked to the captain at lunch and he said that'd be an administrative nightmare for, because you can't tell whether they're fishing for trout or fishing for bass. And so, that, yeah, it's correct. That'd be a, yeah. a nightmare. Walk, yeah, Chair Walk, Commissioner Lafar. Not only a nightmare, but our bass are very important fishery in the state of Oregon. I mean, a lot of people love bass. They fish bass. It's People are very passionate about it. <clears throat> so, I mean, there's a lot of value there. I mean, I don't want to, I know that we're dealing with these conservation issues and that's real, 
but we also have to look at like the public that's out there. They really do. They're they're staunch advocates for bass, um, and and on a lot of our pond fisheries that we have out there, largemouth bass fisheries and ponds. I mean, those are great entry level fisheries for kids. We have so many bass tournaments that occur. I mean, we have an incredible amount of bass tournaments that occur. It's very popular. So I don't ever want to like look. At, you know, we have to just realize, I guess, that that is very valuable and very very important. Those are very important species. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Um, I stepped through each of our angling zones really quickly. I uh, just want to make sure that you all are aware uh, that you will not see slides in this presentation for the Southeast, Snake, Columbia, or the Marine Zones because there were no proposals for those areas in 2023. Thus, only 17 changes this year. Um, so the first, will, and, I, and this presentation is just a, a sampling of some of them. I don't want to go into an exhaustive list of every single proposed change. So there's an example which I would, you know, that I've kind of selected as, um, you know, from each of the zones. So just so you're aware, there are more in attachment four. So in the northwest zone, um, there's one proposal in Lost Lake, which is in Clatsop County, um, that all landlocked salmon will be considered trout, and that would be the regulatory change. And the reason why we need to do that is that Lost Lake is often stocked with surplus hatchery coho salmon, and they go in as small fry from the Halem hatchery. And as, as a result of that, they often grow into trout-sized fish. And so those are providing a really valuable opportunity for anglers, but the way our regulations